Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the New Art School and Design Deduct Podcast. Our guest today is Patrick Morgan. Welcome, Patrick. Hello, Lev Terrace. Nice to meet you. Fantastic to have you here. Tell us about you and your work. Um, so I've been working for about 20 years as a commercial artist illustrator. Um, I've also worked as an educator for about 15 years, in and out of education, mentoring, uh, doing basic world well, lectures, Goldsmiths, Royal College. I went to the Royal College, which was great fun. Um, and now I've been moving into more immersive environments, which has been quite interesting, uh, demanding, and I guess as a creative, we're all very curious. That's what keeps me going. And uh, it's not always a financial thing. So it's uh, an interesting playground at the moment. Mm. So tell us, I about, guess that, tell us about your latest project. Um, so I've, I've had a bit of funding um, from a seed investor, which was invested in some VR. We were doing lots of VR projects. VR more about how to work in VR um, as a designer and creating toolkits for designers to work in more creative ways and use new tools, a bit like when Photoshop first came out. Um, that's one of my sort of hidden projects that I've been working on and developing for about three years. Uh, creatively, I've been working obviously as a commercial artist, working in the States. Uh, my agent, uh, Andrew Coningsbury, who you probably know, who, who we showed as when we were students, when we went to Kingston. Um, and we've kept our relationship going for, I guess, since I graduated in 99. Um, and Andrew's always been a great ambassador and a real support for illustrators today. Because illustration is a, a space that moves fast. It's very fast paced. Um, and you have to kind of be quite nimble and almost adapting to the landscape and always mentally pushing yourself. I think it's one of the hardest uh, disciplines in the field. And as a sort of an illustrator who draws a lot, um, which we always talk about, me and you, um, about drawing being sort of a backbone to the skills of what's required to be a, a, a good creative, I think, not only just an illustrator, is having a, a true understanding of how to work. And I guess that's kind of, I, I'm, I'm, I've been through the, the field of artists working to survive. Now I'm in the, 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 the second stage or the third stage of my career, which is uh, I guess working on projects that I really enjoy, working on projects that push me, make me excited, and I guess uh, have a different uh, meaning to me. I remember when we had a lecture at Kingston University by David Hughes, and he said, I think he had a mental breakdown uh, after about 10 years drawing for the BBC, and he was like saying, that was it, enough. <laughs> Threw his whole portfolio in the bin, and then started again, and started a new journey. And I think that's so true. And I, I didn't know whether it would mean anything to me, but I guess now, 20 years later, I can see how every 10 years, the cupboards or the, the, the sketchbooks get burned or thrown away, and then a whole new realm of work starts. So it's probably, probably decade-based. Every decade you have a change, you have a shift. Um, and I guess I, I love drawing. I draw every day, but I, I'm kind of working more in the creative direction field now um, and working with young... I love working with young people. I've realised young people are great. They're full of ideas. They're full of energy, which I was probably very disruptive, very full of energy. Um, but that's what gets projects to be different, yeah, a bit more, and relevant. One of the things is, how is your project relevant, relevant to now? And that's what I, I guess, from projects-wise, like I'm working on projects with the V&A, um, um, the VR stuff, running masterclasses in drawing with Christian Dior. Um, they're projects, but I don't, I, I see as um, no one project defines you at the moment is everything that I'm doing, even bringing up my kids and teaching them how to think in a different way. That's part of my project, part of my journey. 
Fantastic, fantastic. Tell us about your path into, into teaching, into education. Um, so I was working after I graduated. Well, when I left university, I had no money. Um, and then I became a builder. I was doing some building work. I was doing carpentry uh, because I knew a lot about carpentry and I did a lot of craft work while I was at university. And I did that just to pay off some of my student loan. And then one day I was sitting in Hammersmith and I met an, a student who was in my class, uh, Tor, I think was her name. And uh, she, she saw me sitting there on my building hat and said, oh, so what are you doing now? And uh, I realized, what am I doing? So I, I was, at that point, had an eight, like I just had debut art. And I was waiting for commissions just to get some work. And then I got some work and then I did some big jobs. And then I like, worked for Levi's and I worked for Selfridges and did some big branding jobs. Um, and then somebody rang me up one day and said, we're a private Italian fashion school, Instituto Marangoni. Uh, I thought it was a joke. Um, and they said, we're opening a school in London. Would you be interested in coming? Because we want craftsmen, we want people that can draw. So I went for a meeting, showed them my portfolio, which was still screen prints and bits and bobs and sketchbooks. And they were like, perfect, this is what we want. And are you going to be tough? Was, the only question is, are you going to be tough? And can you draw? And I was like, well, definitely. I could definitely do both of them. So that was the beginning segue into teaching. I never knew nothing about teaching. I had no understanding of curriculum. I knew nothing about pedagogy. I knew nothing. So I taught for about five years before we were assessed as a school because it was a private school. And then I learned, oh, there's a lot more to teaching than just turning up and telling the class what to do and showing them the skills. And then uh, I learned more about teaching. and It was fascinating. I did my PGCE, which I loved. I thought it was like a, a, a counselling session to the art world or the education world. I really enjoyed that because it's sort of self-reflective and it goes into the inner you. So I love that side of teaching. Um, and then really getting on with the students. And I, I taught I taught on a graphics and illustration course at Barangoni. I taught on the fashion course. I loved fashion. I've always loved fashion. Um, and I love the idea of the pace of fashion. I looked at books and magazines when I was in Kingston about uh, ID magazine, the face. And I don't know why. I just probably liked culture. Um, no one guided me. My parents didn't do art. Anything. My mum just gave us pen and pencils. I had no sort of mentorship. I had a friend, Jim Starr, who you know, and I think he was my personal tutor of how to go around the library and pick out any book and learn from it. And that was my education system. We did have a great uh, Kingston, which is still now Jake, uh, Brian Love, all, all celebrities who, in my mind, were great ambassadors for illustration and still, still are. I know Jake's making a, a, a great space. I think they were the forefront of illustration. And you know that, Terry. Absolutely. 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 So how do you see design education now? Uh, is, there, is there something that you'd like to do differently if you could, if you had a magic wand? I think everybody, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and heard a lot of people speaking and moaning and complaining or saying good things. But I think with education, we, me and you speak quite a lot about it and we're constantly ringing each other up and discussing how to improve or break down barriers. And I think the education system is the way it is. I think if you can create an environment that enables people to be creative. When I went to Middlesex to do my foundation, uh, the tutors were off smoking outside and talking to other students. And I was just bamboozled by the facilities. I was like, I've never had so many facilities, screen printing, ceramics. And if you put a creative in that space, they will just grow and flower. And Kingston was the same. The facilities was amazing. Um, and I, I, I just loved every day uh, that I went to university. It was like a dream. Facilities, because I, I couldn't afford facilities. You know, my mum and dad didn't have the money to have facilities for me, just a pencil. So when I got there and you could use a lathe or you could use entry tables, 
screen print. I think I used every piece of equipment in the whole of Princeton University, from from the library all the way up to screen printing. Um, and if you have them spaces, also the tutoring, we had, I think the reason I went to Kingston was because I was told it's the hardest university to get into. I was also told that every day they will beat you up, uh, drawing wise. And that was why I applied because I went to school and nobody taught me how to do anything. And I just thought, I want to go somewhere where it's the hardest and I'm going to get really put through the paces like going to a training camp. And Kingston was that training camp. And we really, all of us left after three years, exhausted, happy, uh, and I think well-educated. So Kingston for me was a full 360 education. And how that's changed is, I guess Kingston may be the same, I don't know, but other, other universities, like when I went to the RCA, they offer uh, life drawing classes. But I think it could be more, I guess that you're not kids anymore. So if you want to do it, you can do it. If you find it part of your need, then you can go. But uh, um, I guess with drawing, when we were at Kingston, we were kind of brought into the space and every day we turned up and we were doing different projects. And I think we still love that sort of experience. And we, we really, we, we were taught that way and we were meant to, carry it on, almost like Bible. Here's the Bible. I'm going to preach you the words of Christ that you're going to now go on and you're going to preach them words as well. So maybe that's the way it was meant to be, Left Terrace. We, we're the new preachers of the word of during. Well, absolutely. However, uh, education has changed tremendously since our days at Kingston. Uh, yeah. and, and the challenge is, that uh, educators uh, in the West have to face right now are quite uh, tremendous. So uh, what would be your suggestion on, 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 on creating something different? Um, I think there'll always be barriers. And I always think I remember Brian Love when he was at Kingston pulling his hair out mm -hmm. about the, the politics of the school. And he wanted to run it his way. So maybe he just hid it well. So I think education's always been education and it's down to the tutors to pull out their hammers and bash down the education walls and uh, implement their way of working. And, and the students are your voices and they'll be the people that celebrate you. So hopefully you may not have the, uh, the backing of the school, but you'll definitely have the back. I always wanted the backing of the students. Because the students are the people that I care about. The school, I don't care. All I want is students to be great, students to do well, um, and then students to leave and get a job, and then five years later they go, thank you for beating me up, I had a great time, and you wrestled every part of my drawing world, and now I feel that I can celebrate, and I'm, and I'm doing well, and I'm making, a, I'm making money out there, and I'm living from it. So I guess that's the goal, really, is to make sure that students who we educate will go and get jobs. But that, that's the main problem is, I remember Alex Williamson, when he was an external examiner at the RCA, he asked me, because I went back as a mature student, and he said to me, well, is this um, school teaching the right way to get you a job? That was one of the questions, and I wasn't too sure. <laughs> uh, but now when I leave, I think, yeah, they... They're not here to teach you only how to um, emulate what is already a job. They're teaching you how to think about how to change the jobs, how to build new jobs. And I think that's what we learned at the RCA. And it, it takes many years, many, many years for it to be deep inside you. And uh, it, I don't know, it's like you've taken a pill or something. And after a while, it starts to grow or manifest or whatever it does but uh the experience i had there was very different from my kingston which was more about learning how the craft learning the craft and then rca was learning how to think that was the difference i saw between the two disciplines of the schools and i guess that's ma level as well is getting you to think deeper um the barriers of education as we can as we mentioned is you hammer out and bash them down and uh left terrace you're strong enough i'm strong enough 
he can fight them hard enough. Um, and I think that you just keep going. And the students will speak. To you. Of course. So again, you mentioned employment. What would be your advice to students or graduates that are just starting out now uh, and want to enter into, into the world of art and design? I had a, a message this morning and someone wrote me a message and they only wrote, can you get me a job? <laughs> I, funnily, I'm speaking to you today and you've asked me that question because I'm like, I, I can't get you a job. Uh, I'd love to offer you a job, but I haven't seen your work. I don't know who you are. Um, and a lot of illust illustrators, we all work independently. We're self-employed. self, sort of self um, And you could have staff really and truly, you know, it's better to bring in new people all the time, unless you have a studio. Um, but a lot of illustrators like Quint and Blake, various other illustrators, they'll work on their own. Um, Morris Sendak, we name hundreds of them. And they've always worked alone. And I think we're kind of a little bit loners. We're a little bit ego, so no one could be in the room with us anyway. Um, and I think that's maybe what makes an illustrator. With regards to getting jobs, I think is when I first left Kingston, I built a website uh, and put my work up online and the next thing, bang, I started getting jobs. And I think the internet is this magical space. Uh, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you're using is the space to have a voice. Um, it's really enabling all illustrators, all artists, all creatives, or whatever you're doing, to get a voice out there. It was like my space for music and I think Instagram's probably our MySpace. I'm seeing loads of illustrators and they're saying they make all their money from Instagram. Um, I've had some commissions from Instagram. I haven't really pushed Instagram heavily. Maybe I'm in a different place to the youngsters. Um, but I think for me, I'm, I'm in a different, different side of that and I'm trying to work around the edges. And, that, and the hard thing about if you build your uh, infrastructure around social media, it can only go so long. And you really need to build the breadth of work. So once you start with social media, is it is for now, and it's like fashion. You can't, and fashion goes in and out. It's a trend. So you have to then, once you learn from you're getting a job or doing illustration or whatever you're going to do and get commissions, start thinking, how do I make this really more robust? And that will be my advice to anybody is, build a robust system around your social media and then and keep going and keep pushing and don't just rely on one source because it could dry up. We've had, everybody has to do that, everybody. And, and keep developing. Your agents and people might not like the fact that you're changing styles. As a creative, all creatives are different. We, and this new work might open up new doors and it will feel uncomfortable. I was reading a, a book by Prada and it was talking about rough and smooth you know smooth was what is commercial and what people find acceptable and then rough is something that doesn't feel good but that tends to be the area that makes the great work that, that's what they were saying was the luxury side of Prada was the rough the rough is the art the creative and that's the feeling that you should be getting it doesn't feel good and I, I think that's what makes it scary it makes it financially tough no one who's an illustrator, ever has a smooth journey. They'll have a dip. Picasso, he had a bad time when he had to sell etchings because no one, his work went out of fashion because abstract expressionism came in. But it's, you know, everybody goes through it. It's part of life. And it makes you rethink. It makes you refocus, recalibrate, rebuild the system. So I, I think it's a great space to be young. So it, that it's an opportunity. It's there for the taking. Just do good stuff. Fantastic. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Um, so I have a website, patrickmorgan.co.uk. You can see my work. On there used to be lots of illustration work. Now you're going to see a, a mix of jobs that I've been doing, um, I guess, since my MA. <coughs> um, I have a Twitter. I don't use Twitter too much because... Um, it's more of a place for heavy dialogue and I just don't have the time. I've got three kids. So Twitter, I post stuff up on Twitter. I kind of keep myself there, but I don't think I make the most of Twitter. Not like you, Lefkaris. I know you're a master of 
Twitter. Um, Instagram, I post every day. Or I post something every other day. I use that space good for me. Uh, so P Morgan Art is my Instagram. I've been running a, a fashion drawing awards uh, yes, the world wide. And that has been brilliant. I loved fashion drawing. I've always loved them. Uh, I was just messaging Jason Brooks, who I guess when I was young and growing up, and he was kind of probably a little bit older than me. I don't know his age, but I was doing work for one club and he was doing it for another hey, candy clubs. And so he was kind of in the clubbing world of drawing. Illustration was quite good in clubbing. And he, he was messaging me saying, you know, it's a great time for fashion illustration and fashion drawing. It's taken so long because of photography coming in and bashing it down. And I think Instagram's really opened the doors for fashion illustrators. And with my, I, I guess now is um, who creates the voices, who becomes the leaders, who the, who's willing to put their ego on the, the library bookcase and say, I'm willing to maybe put my, my ego of being an artist aside and help elevate other illustrators. And, and we've built up a quite a good community. I think we've got about 10,000 followers now over a year. So it's not bad. But it's quite good. And I think there's many more. I know other um, bloggers or Instagrammers who got like nearly 100,000 followers. But we, you know, I'm trying to build, I'm not buying my community. So I'm trying to build them slowly. Uh, and, you know, we, we had an exhibition recently in Lille with a company called the Acid Gallery. They had a great show called Fashion Illustration with most of the illustrators who I don't represent them, but I, I've, they've been part of the awards or they've been shortlisted last year. And it, it, I, all I, I'm like a hunter-gatherer now. I'm going around looking for good work, um, seeing what's, what's pushing drawing, who's doing a sighting sale. And not only hand-drawn work, it could be, like I saw a guy who was doing printmaking, uh, we had three disciplines, which was experimental, documentary, and commercial. I really wanted to open up disciplines to, there are illustrators who are experimental, so I don't want to ostracize that it is the smooth illustrator, as I, as I call it, the commercial one. That's great, but that doesn't excite me. It's not the only thing that really gets me going. Um, so that's something that I've been really kind of finding. And then our next awards, we're doing uh, three, we're doing facades, which is interiors and buildings, architecture, illustrators, uh, faces, so lots of portraits, figurative, um, we've been looking at lots of figurative work, and objects, so the mundane object. And it could be a luxury object as well. So I've had lots of Chanel bags and things like that. But it's good to just get people. And also, uh, one thing I learned when I was at university was the work you create is the work you're going to get. So I'm trying to get people to generate work that potentially could get them new work. They may not know I'm doing this, but that's my goal is that they'll generate work, whether it's drawing a, a, a Fendi bag or a Prada bag, and then people go, wow, and oh, I can realise that. And I remember Jake saying to us at Kingston, um, if you draw dogs, you're only going to get dog work. <laughs> and it's that, it was that simple. So if we can get... If we can get people to draw things that potentially could get them new work, that's sort of what I'm trying to do is slowly lead them in, uh, um, lead them forward without actually forcing them. No one wants to be forced. So, yeah, so that, that, uh, that's FIDAworldwide.com. FIDA. FIDA, the Europeans have been saying FIDA. The, uh, the Brits have been saying so. FIDA, FIDA, F-I-D-A. Uh, and I found out there's a, a, a women's war company in India called Fever as well. So oh. <laughs> but we are top of Google. So if you type us in, you should come back. Brilliant. Fantastic. Any, any last piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? Um, well, not really advice. I guess it's great what you're doing, Left okay. Terrace. So I think um, I, I appreciate it. And it's taken us a little bit of time for you to get me to do this podcast. Uh, and... You know, you're getting great speakers on here. And, you know, I, I, I listen to Debbie Millman as well, who does Design Matters. And I think it's great that um, you're doing something, looking at the education side of design and looking to see how people could maybe 
make the space more interesting, make the space more uh, inclusive. Um, obviously, we're talking about diversity quite a lot, but I think for you, like you've had great speakers and it's been very diverse. So I think that's just a natural instinct. And I think a lot of people talk about diversity, but I think, you know, we, if you live in London or you live in certain places, we're used to diversity anyway. So it, we quite, we just naturally go that way and we're happy to just work with people that are good or naturally gifted or whatever they're going to do. And we try to kind of have a humanist approach of bringing everyone forward. And I think that was one of the things you were talking to me quite a lot about is having this more uh, open, inclusive space that anybody could uh, participate in. It wasn't a financial driven thing. It was more, um, how do we make great work? How do we make people get involved? And you don't necessarily need to be the most uh, financially backed student. Um, I wasn't when I went to Kingston. So, you know, I was probably a, a, an outsider a little bit, but I, 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 it was a great opportunity for me. And I think I was lucky the grant system was there. You know, that enabled me to come. So I think if what you're doing is great. And that's probably one of the main things that I'm happy to see is, you know, Zoom is hard to do, all these Zoom talks. But I, I'm happy to do it because I think um, you're doing a great thing and it's good people to maybe hear, hear what I've got to say. I hear myself say enough, so it may be nice someone hears what an illustrator has to say who's trying trying hard all the time and, and keeping to work and uh, keep moving. And I think that's, keep going, keep going, Fantastic. keep staying creative. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a, have a fantastic, fantastic day. Thank you, Dr. Bye-bye.